Wednesday night Christian Center where Jesus is Lord. We want to just uh, welcome you to the space. Uh, you might be joining us north, south, east, and west. Hallelujah. You're somewhere, and we know that the Lord is good. I want to encourage you to uh, hang around and participate in our evening uh, Bible study. We're talking about a very powerful topic, and not very popular, but very powerful, because we're talking about breaking curses. Um, there are some things that are going on in our lives, and you ever hear the, the, uh, the, um, that old song, 16 tons, what do you get? I'm singing better than they did. Tennessee, Ernie Ford, another day older and deeper in debt. Something, something, St. Peter, don't you call me because I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. That was a very popular, hey, uh, Sis Angela, a very popular song when I was a kid. And um, it's kind of interesting that in that song, there is sorrow, shame, debt, guilt, um, lack of capacity. Did, did I say it was a very popular song? <laughs> my goodness, <clears throat> pardon me, my goodness. All I'm saying is that we are surrounded by accepted curses and we need to be able to identify them, number one, and really put an end to them. And in order to cancel the curse, we must, number one, know that it exists. You know how um, there have been times when there might be an errant charge on your credit card. And you say, well, what is this? Who charged me this money? And you look into it, and it was an error. They charged you, but it was an error. And all you had to be was aware of it so that you could address it so that you could bring an end to it. So we're going to be talking about those kinds of things, but also going uh, quite a bit deeper in terms of the scripture and what does the word of God say about curses. And I want you to know that it's no small matter. So I'm encouraging you, if you know somebody, watch this. If you know somebody with a foul mouth, uh, if you ever want the bad news, just call so-and-so. If you ever want to hear something negative, you know anybody that's negative? Isn't that, is it you? <laughs> all right, all right, enough is enough. So this is what I want to encourage you to do. Hey, 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 Sister Marilyn, blessings to you. We want to encourage you to, to uh, get a notepad, paper, pencil. You know the drill. Uh, if you're on Facebook, YouTube, I'm encouraging you to make comments that, that feeds the spirit of the room and lets us know that you are being fed, getting the word of God. Again, Wednesday night Bible study, Faith Life Christian Center, Pastor Daryl Barnett here at your service, and we're going to look into heaven just an awesome time. Now, this is our Wednesday night service, so we want to open the doors of the church. You remember how they used to say that for... Uh, uh, bringing people into salvation. We're going to open the doors of the church for uh, the time of offering. Glory be to God. I want to start you with the scripture. Let's see who's in. Cheryl Lynn. Amen. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Good to have you with us. I know a couple of Cheryl Lynn's. Amen. Kind of a unique name for me to know a couple of them. <laughs> All right. Listen, I want you to open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Haggai. Haggai. You know, um, it used to be uh, when I was first coming into the word of faith and it was like the first occasion where, amen, amen, Sister Sherilyn, it, it used to be that you would go to church and not need your Bible. And then when the word of faith church came up or Pentecost or whatever, you'd go to church and you'd need your Bible, but because you hadn't been in it, for over the course, of, oh, you know where the 23rd Psalm was, you know, th uh, John 3, 16, you know, the, the uh, Scripture Hall of Fame. Uh, but to find Haggai, and, and the reason I said that is because the preacher said, okay, now turn to Haggai, and he said, oh, Lord, y'all here? Listen, then he'd say, go to the table of contents, and it was kind of a running theme uh, when we were first going to the Bibles. Amen, Brother George, glory be to God. It was a grunting theme, kind of laughing at people flipping. Then we got tabs. Say amen, somebody. Bible tabs. And you could just flip to your tab in the Bible. And, and that sped it up quite a bit. 
And um, now we have our phones. <laughs> and some of you are still searching. Okay, where's, where's, where's Haggai? <laughs> In Jesus' name. All right. Uh, we're just having fun with you. Not, not at your expense. <clears throat> Pardon me, but having fun with you. So I want to I want to cover this in Haggai. Now this is um, sometimes you hear a minister say, "I want to build your faith in giving." That's not quite what I'm after here. I want you to build your faith in how to engage the prosperity covenant in the Word of God. Uh, what do we, we talk about in healing or many other things, according to your faith, be it unto you. They came to Jesus. Do you believe that I'm able to do this? They said, yea, Lord. What did he tell them? According to your faith, be it unto you. And so there are times when we're building our faith for things. I want to make certain that we're building our faith for the things that matter. So in Haggai chapter two and verse number eight, listen to this scripture. This is a this is an instruction set, if there ever was one. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Now, clearly he's talking about the house of God, and you've heard perhaps the scripture preached in a offering giving kind of setting, and they're talking about building the church, and we need carpet and we need windows and we need lights and we need cam lights, camera, action, right? Let's take another glimpse at this text and let's talk about plugging into the covenant of increase. Um, I'm going to talk about, well, I want to talk about spiritual increase and natural increase because what we find here is a blueprint. And um, the uh, in verse number seven, it says, before we get to verse 8, it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. That's the starting point. Some of your ways have produced sufficiency. Amen. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Some of your ways have produced more than enough. And we have not just enough to make it, but we have enough in surplus. And some of your ways have produced abundance. Well, we talk about abundance and no lack, but but your ways must be in get. You know, um, if we were going to, um, my mom made a lemon meringue pie. Say, man, somebody, did you? Did you? I should have had one of those sound effects going ding and saw the gleam. You know, on the corner of my eye, and a very <clears throat> a very simple recipe to her, but it made and makes, I might add, one awesome pie. Well, how, how does she do that? Well, hey, hey, Sister Sherilyn, she had, a, a, she had her ways. She had, you ever hear somebody? She knew her way around the kitchen. She knew she had her ways and she would get in there and she would just I want to say pop, 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 and all of a sudden, every you know, salivating, Pavlov's dog. I mean, salivating. It was it was just just delicious, and I'm saying that because we've wanted the end product, but we have not always had the ways, and I'm showing you here the ways, and and I want you to consider this. Go up to the mountain and bring wood. Well, understand, the mountain is a high place. And I know the ministers will say, um, go, go to the church, which is the high place. B but what I want you to consider for just a moment, go into the place of prayer. Go into the place of, I am before the Lord regarding increase. And bring wood. Bring, bring wood? What are we going to do with the wood? Well, it tells us right here. Bring wood and build the house. And that's where they tell you, okay, we're going to build the house and your 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 dollars are your wood. Okay, that works, but it's bigger than that. Because every one of you has a dream and has a vision. 
every one of you wants something or desires something or have a right, let me put it like that, have a right to more than you are currently receiving, more space than you are occupying, more opportunity than you have access to currently, that there is something beyond the pale or there's something above where you are now. You've done pretty good for yourself. Amen. But if you could bless a few more children or if I'm saying there's more. So go up to the high place in prayer and bring wood. What is the wood? What is the wood? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, faith, the word of God, is the substance of things that we are setting our expectation on. You know the illustration, the thermostat. <laughs> I almost said microphone, but the thermostat is on the wall. And it's a little hot in here and you desire it to be cooler. And what you do is you go and you set the number. It looks like it's on 80. No wonder it's warm in here. And you set it down into the comfort zone. And everybody in here knows that instantly the temperature does not change. Am I right about it? But instantly you have set in motion the mechanism that's going to send a signal outside to that uh, air conditioning unit, wherever it sits, and it's going to begin to engage and spin, and it's going to begin to do what's necessary to produce comfort. We need to produce, take the wood, that which is necessary, into the space and begin to build comfort. My goodness. Now, how are we going to do that? Um, we're going to build the house that we can take pleasure in it. What I'm saying <coughs> is I'm not asking you just to give here at Faith Life for, hey, Brother Richard, always good to see you, for the purpose of sustaining Faith Life. That's wonderful. But I need you to see yourself engaging the Lord for the things that bring you comfort and bring the wood that brings you comfort. And the Lord will tell you, well, this is, you've been limping. Comfort means no more soreness in my joints. You've been whatever, the, whatever, whatever, because everybody's wood is different. And I'm talking about the word of God. Hey, 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 Brother Richard. Oh, okay, just saying hello. Okay, I'm, you know, I got to lean in to see what's written there. But I'm just saying this, folks. This is a big deal. And so where's the wood? The wood is the resources that you use. And we know uh, from Scripture that we build in the kingdom through seed time and harvest. And I'm not going to all of those Scriptures. I'm just saying this that this is not a selfish ambition and I'm not just flipping the script so that you can think for yourself and then give to the church. I'm saying this is a principle of the word of God on how we build. I was in a conference just last week and um, there was a situation where I had just got done speaking and a brother came and gave me a, a Holy Ghost handshake, if you know what that is. It was a high denomination uh, bill of legal currency in the United States. And I said, bless you. And I just put it in my pocket. Right after that, there was another brother gave up, got up and he was given the offering message. And I said, okay, the Lord said, your seed is in your pocket. I didn't even look at what it was until I pulled it out. And remember it was a high level denomination, uh, us greenback. And I put it in boom, no questions asked because I was building. I'm thinking, I know what I need. I'm not sharing it with you. I know what I need. I put it in an envelope, let it go. I understand building. Before they took up the offering, a sister came by and said, Pastor, the Lord told me to sow into your ministry. And I said, praise the Lord, sis. And she said, how do you, how do you spell your church name? So, so da, 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 da. I gave that her, her that information. And what she gave was way more than what I had just given. 
the time comes where the plowman will overtake the reaper. Well, you know, that's extra money. I could go and get, folks, it works. We're putting up the information on your screen right now so that you can build, build. Hear God, what are you building? What does it take to build it? I don't know. I don't know. I encourage you to be a tither, but I'm also encouraging you to be a builder through the covenant principles. Go up into your mountain. Lord, what should I do right now? And bring wood. I know what I have available. I got to build it in and build a house and I will take pleasure in it. The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. That's the pleasure in it. Give not grudgingly nor necessity for God loveth a cheerful giver. He, he loves a happy and hilarious giver. Why? Because I'm building something. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. You have those uh, tithes and offerings and, and, and woods ready. <laughs> hey, man, this is what we're going to do. We're going to bless it. We're going to call it multiplied. We're going to call this wood multiplied like the wood, I believe, for the ark was multiplied. And ultimately, he built it with that wood and it carried him above the storm. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to sow, grow, build, and plant. Father, as we are giving, it is given unto us, good measure, pressed out, shaken together, and running over does men give into our bosom. We thank you for the build. We thank you for the blessing and the opportunity to hear, learn, and grow in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Jesus is Lord. Well, we're going to move right into our message for the day. And I, I want to pick up uh, in the commentary area that we had just left off in. And that is the area of understanding that we have been... Oh, okay, let's pray and then we'll move forward. Amen, amen. Hey, Sister Lena, blessings to you. Glory be to God. Um, as we move forward, bless this word, Lord. Bless the hearers. Bless the practitioners of the word. Father, that every place the sole of our foot shall tread has been given unto us. We thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I was um, giving an intro uh, to um, the message today, and we're talking about uh, breaking curses. And um, again, not always popular text, but, but hear me out. <clears throat> A very well-known scripture in uh, Proverbs 18, 21, 21, 18, it says um, that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And uh, the, uh, those that love it will eat the fruit thereof. Uh, let me see. Yeah. 2118. I, you know, um, and that's kind of interesting where it says, uh, no, 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 no. 1821. I'm, I apologize. Yeah. 1821. Proverbs 1821. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now it's interesting a lot of people, they want to clean it up. And you've likely heard it quoted more than not in a reverse faction where it would say life and death is in the power of the tongue. But that's not what the scripture records. The scripture records that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And you might say, well, Pastor, it's the same thing. Well, I beg to differ. Um, but it says, and death and life are in the power of the tongue. And are in the power of the tongue and they that love it, love it what? Love the power of the tongue. There are people that love the power of the tongue and it seems like in, in these days, uh, I don't know where you live, but where I live, it seems that some people um, want some juicy gossip. <laughs> you know, juicy, go juicy gossip. I guess that's when it runs all down your neck, you know, that, that level of gossip. And I'm talking about that juicy gossip only because in order for gossip to be juicy, blood has to flow. 
death and life are in the power of the tongue. Something has to, something has to have cost someone something in order for the gossip to be juicy. And I'm only putting it, uh, putting the uh, emphasis there because when we talk about uh, uh, canceling curses, it's one thing to cancel a curse. It's another thing to release them with such frequency that the canceling of them is nullified. I'll use this example. Um, um, I can have a, a position in a place and uh, I'm sitting on the porch and uh, I, I, I must have washed in syrup last night because the flies are all over and I, I'm, I'm just trying to, to catch the flies and, and when they get on me, I'm, I'm popping my, I'm doing everything I can to get rid of the flies. Now, I'm attracting them to, to me because, because I'm sweet. No, I'm just teasing that. Illustration, illustration, illustration. But I'm attracting them to me because they're they're coming to me. But I I can't you know one lands on my head. I say, oh man, they're even landing on my face, and I'm angry and I can't and I and I I'm gonna go I'm gonna go inside. I'm gonna escape the flies. And so I do what's necessary to escape the flies because the flies, let's say they're they are the accursed thing right now, and I want to be free from them. And then I'm watching television, and I'm seeing people that are living in the bush living outside, and uh, we usually associate that with uh, people that are in some level of poverty or some third world uh, organization, not organization, third world company, uh, third world country or something on that wise. And the flies crawling on their face and around their eyes, and sometimes we'll see where flies are crawling on their food and um, they just wave them off long enough to take a bite and then put it back down and the flies come and, and the flies on their face, they don't even bother. And the reason that they don't bother is not because they want the flies on them, but there's so many that swatting at or killing a few of them it makes no difference. Now you've seen that. I mean, you come on now. You you've seen that before, and you said, "My goodness, how in the world can they allow those flies to just stay on them?" Well, there's just in that respect, there's no sense in swatting them because you can't get rid of them. There are more flies than there are swats. Swat fly energy in me. Well, I think I'd swat them until you go to that country and there's so many flies you can't swat them. There are times when curse-filled language has so saturated the society that we are spouting curses, but they're tugging on our heartstrings at a level where we love the song and we ignore the curse. Um, let's just kiss and say goodbye. Many months have passed me by. I'm gonna miss you. I'm gonna miss you, I can't lie. Some of you, what, what song is that, Pastor? He ain't from that generation. I'm saying, <laughs> look it up on YouTube. The song is Kiss and Say Goodbye. Oh man. All of the heartstring tugs, so popular. And Pastor, we're just singing a song. How many of you have heard the text that the serpent was more subtle than all of the beasts of the field? The enemy understands what we read in Proverbs eighteen twenty one, that death and life is in the power of the tongue. And so he serves it up subtly. He has infiltrated our speech to the degree where we are singing curses into the house. I, all I can think of, or, or, or the one that I was singing by Tennessee Ernie Ford, it was a, a song when I was, um, yeah, uh, you know, uh, uh, young, uh, 16 tons, one do you get, another day older and deeper in debt, St. Peter, don't you call me, because I can't go, I owe my soul to this company store, 
doom, 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 doom. I'm putting those up front because when we start talking about curses, you know, devil, I bind you in the name of Jesus. So, so for, and we start getting very spiritual about it when it has become a spiritual condition, true enough, that has been laced with natural phenomenon. And I'm not saying that every worldly song, because you pastor, you quoting worldly songs. Oh, yeah. Uh, and there's some church songs that have done us no good. Some church songs have lied to us. I got shoes, you got shoes, all God's children have shoes. When I get to heaven, gonna put on my shoes and gonna walk all over God's heaven. What about heaven and hell or here on earth? What, what, I'm, I'm just saying that many times we haven't examined all of the songs that we know and love, but what we have produced is a situation where we're waiting on heaven for our rewards. That's not biblically, ac biblically accurate. But if we have the mindset that we're waiting on heaven for our rewards, then we are willing to postpone blessings while we live. These things ought not be so. In Job chapter 34 and verse number 10, I'm, I'm just trying to make it real enough so that you'll begin to re-examine some of the things that you're saying. And, you know, we always pick on the favorites, favorite, uh, the most common, uh, these shoes are killing me. Um, um, my back is killing me. Um, these children are driving me crazy. You driving me crazy. You have fooled around and got on my last nerve. What about this? You bug me. What about, I'm talking about all of the things, you know, all of the things that we have made common phrases that have released commands, sounds into the earth realm that could ultimately compromise us. We have not called them curses, I'm just talking. I'm just singing. That song is good. What don't don't you like that song? What what is it? You don't like anything that's good on the radio? I'm saying we have built in a culture that has embraced cursing at a non what we call a non-profane level. But what is more profound or profane than speaking calamity on your life or the lives of your loved ones? Let me tell you what. Watch this. I love her, but she cannot cook. Well, why would you say that? She cannot cook. Why, why, why wouldn't we fix our words in a way that we're not cursing? Watch this. You never listen to me. I'm saying we keep using words in a derogative. I'm just, can I say how I'm feeling? Well, yeah, but when we use our words in a way that draws the curse, I'm just trying to turn on the light. That's all I'm trying to do. In Job chapter 34, verse number 10, it says, oh, Therefore hearken unto me, ye men of understanding, far be it from God that he should do wickedness. Isn't that something? Far be it from God. I've got my electronic uh, notes here. Far be it from God that he should do wickedness. We talk, talk blah, blah, blah. If I just slow down, we could get this thing out. Job 34, 10. Um, far be it from God that he should do wickedness and from the Almighty that he should commit iniquity. That means God is not against you. And he's not causing things to happen for you. He said, ah, I'm going to quote. Let's go to verse number 11 and then we'll jump around. For the work of man shall he render unto him. That's what we've been talking about. The work of man. How, how do we, what do you mean, Pastor, you, you're talking about singing, you're just talking about talking. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, the, the, the earth, in the, in, the, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void. And 
darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, God said, let there be light. And so out of the darkness and out of the calamity, light burst on the scene. Somebody can say amen to that. Now, then the Lord goes on to describe the creation as we understand it. And then the Bible has the nerve to tell us on the sixth, on the seventh day he rested and the Lord finished his work. The Lord finished his work on the sixth and the, on the sixth day and the seventh day he rested. Finished his work on the sixth day and the seventh day he rested. Turn with me to um, uh, Genesis and let's show you that as they say uh, right quick. In Genesis chapter one, and I want to go to verse number 31. In Genesis 1 31, it says, and God saw everything that he made and behold, it was very good. And, um, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day, chapter two, verse number one. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work. When did he roll up his sleeves? Did he get his knees dirty? Did he sweat? What, what happened? No, 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 no. We saw him working because the Bible tells us clearly, and God said, verse 24, let the earth bring forth the living creatures and the cattle and the creeping things and, and, and so forth. And verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image. Glory be to God. I'm just saying, God was went to work by saying. Saying was his work. And so when we're over here in Job chapter 34, verse number 10, therefore hearken unto me, ye men of understanding, far be it from God that he should do wickedness from and from the Almighty that he should commit iniquity. For the work of a man shall he render unto him. Now you thought we were getting paid. Well, okay, okay, whoa, 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 whoa. We are receiving the wages of our work, but we've been designed in the image and likeness of God and our work is what we say. Come on, folks, get this thing. Job 34, 11, for the work of a man shall he render unto him and cause every man to find according to his ways. Yea, surely will, uh, uh, and yea, surely God will not do wickedly, neither will the Almighty pervert judgment. Whew. Wow. Jump down to verse number 31. We started here last time, but I just want to make certain that you see it. It says, surely it is meet to be said unto God, I have borne chastisement. I will offend, I will not offend any. That which I see, teach, I see that which I see not, thou me, I have done iniquity, I will do no more. For every So every plague is my reason of offense or ignorance. I'm talking about this thing is for real, folks. Then it goes on to say in Matthew chapter 10, verse number 36, a man's foes shall be they of his own household. My foes... That's my enemy. My enemy shall be of my own household. What kind of household is that? Those people that are close enough to you, where you receive what they said, either, either in offense or even in anger, but you receive what they said, you're never going to amount to anything. I wasn't raised in that house. No, 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 no. Well, why don't, why, why haven't you figured out that you can't cook? Why do you stick all of the words that we have used? And I'm not saying every house is just negative, but enough of them are. Christian households speaking negative words and negative statements. And it's, it's I'm just calling them like I see them, Pastor. Hey, you absolutely are. And every plague is by reason of offense or ignorance. There's a big issue here. A man's foe shall they be of his own household. 
That's why Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 27 says, don't give place to the enemy. And that's what we're talking about. Even if Satan was not against you, many people would not succeed because they've been against themselves. Because they take a message like I'm talking about tonight and they minimize it. Oh, pastor, it can't be like that. That's not the way it works. How would anybody ever survive? Well, the evidence is around us. People are sick and challenged and infirmed, and they don't relate it to what they've been saying. I bind you, devil, in the name of Jesus. Whoa, 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 whoa. It wasn't God, and many times it wasn't even the devil. It was you. Because we didn't take the words of our mouth seriously. Colossians 3 and 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Then it goes into another area. Your members upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. You ever hear that, the, that, that comedian? And um, they were talking about all of the rules and guidelines that were placed on him. And he stood up and said, I can't do nothing. And everybody laughs because he's, more, he's lamenting more the loss of his freedoms rather than the safety that he enjoys as a result of some of those freedoms being taken away. Well, we could go a long way with that statement, couldn't we? This is what I'm saying. I need the curses out of my house. You need them out of your house. I'm not saying I have curses. I'm, I'm making that statement so that you will see that a lot of, oh man, I, you know, every once, I'm not talking about, this is not my confession. I'm just saying what I have heard. You know, every, before this, this time of year is terrible for me. Why is that? Oh, pollen. You have just given, well, pastor, just stating the obvious. Whoa, 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 whoa. The obvious is he was bruised for our iniquities. The wound for our iniquities, bruised for, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement are, now I can't quote Isaiah 53 and verse 5. He was bruised for our iniquities, wounded for our peace. The chest, here, the man, oh man. You know what I'm talking about. That's all right. Hold on there. I'm, I'm getting ready to read it. Glory be to God. I, I'm not, listen, I have a wonderful marriage. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We did esteem him stricken and smitten of God. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Wow. So I do get to confess something about what's going on. I get to say what God said about it. That's why it says death, which seems to be more prominent because the enemy had jumped on the language and the, the, the words of men and compromise them thereby. He doesn't have to go around with a whole bunch of little demons. He he is he is allow, cause, allowing the word to be executed that you released in ignorance. Proverbs six ten, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands. So shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth and they want as an armed man. We have learned ways that are inconsistent with the word of God. And then when we hear the word of God, there has been a custom of defending the destructive ways. Why is that? Because we've had them so long. I was talking with an individual not long ago and they were defending a religion and they claimed the word of God, which is awesome. But when I began to point out things about the religion that they held dear, they began to get angry and then began to tell me if it was wrong, how could it have survived for so many years? The answer is simple. Because nobody called it out. But when I called out the error, 
Don't defend the tradition. Well, you know, my family, we, 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 we call a spade a spade. Don't, don't defend the tradition and embrace the challenge. We got work to do. In Proverbs 6, 15, therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. It goes on to say six things does the Lord hate. Yea, even seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. See, the word of God is speaking plainly to us and I appreciate it. But we recharacterize these scriptures when we start talking about the heart that divides wicked and wicked imaginations. Those are those old uh, um, can't get along songs. Remember uh, this song? You might not because I know I'm of a, I, I apparently of another gener another generation. Just another love song. One more tragedy. Two people were in love. Come on, folks. I'm just saying, how can a love, love song be a tragedy? And, so, and you out there say, I know some love songs that were tragedies. Well, it might be because they sang that old song. I'm saying there are many types of curses. And those that are more subtle, just like the flies on the young child's face or in the adult's face, and they're not swatting them anymore because they have adjusted themselves that swatting doesn't matter. So last time we were talking about these curses and we said that we had located some curses. And um, we said uh, some curses are hidden. Here are some curses that I believe are at the root of most challenges. Here's the benefit of some Bible study right now. We have the curse of God. You can list things or you can come back and watch the video again. The curse of God, the curse of man, the curse of the law. That's the one Christ redeemed us from, Galatians 3.13. Um, the curse of seed, time, and harvest. We talked a little bit about that. The curse of bitterness. And I'm saying this, that that curse of bitterness is more prevalent than people are aware. The curse of the prophets and the curse of Satan. And so we're going to cover these in terms of some scriptural examination um, but I wanted to talk about those that are most common, like the fly. The most common curses aren't the, the ones that are destroying nations. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. So when we talked about the curse of God, we kind of got into that. Um, we um, Here, turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 3, and verse number 14. He said, the curse of God? The curse of God, Pastor? Okay, let's let's straighten it out. Let's see what happened here. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 14. And God said <clears throat> unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed. I'll say, okay, that's okay. He cursed the serpent. That's good. But watch this. Because thou hast done this, what? Beguiled Eve. Because of the role you played in the garden to separate mankind from God. Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. And upon thy belly shall thy go, and dust shall thou eat all of the days of thy life. Now, clearly, the serpent that we see today is a representation of the curse. We have no idea what the serpent originally looked like. None. 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 Because the curse is to go in the belly and eat dust. The slithering tongue, that's a curse. That's the result of the curse. We have no idea what it looked like. It, it'll be something if the Lord allows us to see what the original serpent looked like in the eternity that is coming. But that was a, that's a curse. Every, every, every snake, that's a curse. Then to the woman, he said. We're talking in Genesis 3.16 now. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy, and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire 
shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now see, we've tried to pick and choose uh, how the curses are applied and how they are emphasized and whatnot. My lesson is not marriage and relationship right now. I'm only saying that because of the activity in the garden, we have the curse of God. There was judgment. And we find here that the Lord didn't get out the, the, the birch rod. He said, uh, like some of you understand, go out to that bush and bring me back a switch. He didn't do that. He spoke the judgment that was due that was appropriate for their misconduct. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception and in sorrow, in sorrow shalt thou bring forth children. Wow. It didn't have to hurt. But now the pain is a reminder of a curse and sorrow, joy comes after, but the, the, the pain comes. And watch, thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be for thy husband. Is that a curse? Now the men want to slide by that one. Folks, there'll be another day I'll break that down for you. And he shall rule over thee. I'm saying, husbands, now don't you get puffed up. How are you going to take advantage of the curse? Oh, there's so much teaching here that I'm going by because we're talking about curses right now. We're not talking about men, men, women relations. What I'm saying, however, is this pronouncement of the curse is what God issued. Now, remember, oh, when we've been, Christ set us free from the law of sin and death, we have power now to be, be set free from some of these things, but we have to know how. I'm gonna to get to it. Just hang in there with me. I've got to. Re I got to get you, get you, thirsty, for the answers in the Word of God right now. And then Genesis three and seventeen. God turned to Adam, and to Adam He said, "Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, uh, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying." Thou shalt not eat of it, curse is the ground for thy sake. So the ground is cursed. Have you ever noticed that nobody has to till the ground, go to the store, and buy seed to plant dandelions or milkweed or crabgrass or well, we'll figure it out that there are a number of plants that are in the earth. Seem like, seem like everywhere I go and they just grow and we we pull them up and we pay to pay to have them hauled off. Curse is a crown. In sorrow shall thou eat. I mean, you got to work it all of the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall that bring forth. Thorn bush. We used to have in Detroit when I was growing up, we had a bush, and I, I've seen them in Minnesota, but very prevalent in uh, in Detroit. One was a, a bush we called uh, a cuckaburr, a, cu a cuckaburr plant. You ever get those little bristly balls, and they when they stick to your socks, you can't get them off? Oh, man. Then there was this other bush in we called it the thorn bush. It didn't produce anything but thorns. I mean, there were some leaves in there, but thorns. I'm talking about little needle, black, little hard needle-like things that, that just grew. Don't have anybody push you into that bush. I'm saying those are a result of the curse. Now, we, we're growing up in there with us all of the result over the course of our lifetime. We weren't there when the curse was given, but we recognize that the curse is in the land. Why? Because God cursed some things. If we want to be free from it, we need to know how to get free from it by the word of God. And he goes on, Genesis 3, 19, in the sweat of thy face. He said, well, doesn't he love us? Doesn't he care for us? Why did he put the curse? The curse was judgment. He was training his children 
that there are consequences for misbehavior. Just like you would train your child, there are consequences for misbehavior. It was done as a correction measure. We've seen it as an inconvenience. We've got work to do. So God has cursed some areas of the earth. You know, and this is after Genesis 1, or not, well, after Genesis 12 and 3. I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curses thee. Wait, 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 wait. He's still talking about cursing. He said, don't let anybody, don't, bless, don't, don't, don't let, don't everybody, don't curse my children. Not those that are part of the covenant. I'm going to bless them that bless thee. He released the blessing. And I'm going to curse those that curse thee. He released the curse. People better watch it. Cursing God's children. They bring a calamity on themselves. And then in thee shall all of the families of the earth be blessed. We always emphasize the blessing side, but we would be more blessed if we understood the curse side. If we eliminated the curses, eliminated the curses from infect, affecting and infecting our lives, how much better off we would be. Whew. I said last time, and I'll repeat, when we know that God curses, we should know why he curses. And we've talked about correction, why he curses. Because if you know why he curses, then you can operate in a way to escape the curse. And that's ultimately why we're here today and through this lesson. In Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 33, the curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked. So we jump from the curses that are in the house of the children of God. And now we see the curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked. The wicked is the wicker, the twisted. But he blessed the habitation of the just. Oh, that means one house can be cursed and the next house can be blessed. And the difference is just or being justified or declared righteous. Folks, we need to train our children and our children's children. I can't listen to all that music. Not that it goes boompity, boompity, boom, and I don't understand the words. I need to know what the words are saying because if they're curses, I need to arrest them, stop them. If they're blessings, then I need to let the blessings flow through. All blessings right this way. All curses, stop. We, we have majored and minor and minored and major. In Isaiah 3 and 10, Say to the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with them, for the reward of his hands shall be given him. What are we saying? Death and life is in the power of the tongue. That's what we're saying. And I'm emphasizing it in this manner today because I want you free. I want you free. I, I, are you nitpicking, Pastor? Okay. Put it on me. I'm nitpicking. That's why parents of old used to say, if you can't say anything good, don't say anything at all. We related being free from the curse to walking in righteousness. So we know a lot of that has to do with salvation, but that has to do with Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And so we will get into that. He's redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written. And, the, and then the apostle Paul goes through and he starts talking about uh, our righteousness is a filth, filthy rags. And we have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And so one of the things that God is doing to insulate his children from the curses that are in the land is having them able to receive the righteousness of God in Christ. 
For all have, uh, Romans uh, 3 and 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of the Lord, glory of God. So the per first person that needs to run for his life is the one who is not yet born again. Because that person is under the curse, under the curse of God. And salvation, we talked about, this is where we ended up last time, but it bore re repetition. Salvation is your number one escape from the curse of God. Hebrews 2 and 3. How shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation. When at the first began to be spoken by the Lord. And was confirmed to us by them that heard them. I probably need to wrap this up. This, is, this has been a, a, a good run at it. When you neglect a great salvation, I'll be all right. I'll say it just before I go, because the wages of those that are paid or brought on in the 11th hour is the same that was brought on in the first. No enough scripture to get tripped up. Jesus said over in John chapter 15 that... You can't bear fruit except you abide in him. Abide in him. Dwell in him. So if you're not in Christ, you will be fruitless. I, I, I make plenty money. I'm not talking about that. It's almost spiritually. Wow. Folks, I want to pick up here when we come back next time. But let me end with this. Jesus said in John chapter 15 and verse number five, he said, I'm the vine. I'm the vine. Let me uh, mispronounce that for just a minute. I'm the vein and ye are the arms of the branches. He that abideth in me, connected to me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. I'm trying to bring you into the fold. I'm trying to separate you from the curse. He said, well, I'm born again, I'm saved. Well, then stop cussing. I'm born again, I'm saved. Well, then stop operating in unrighteousness. Reconnect to the vine. Well... I'm not a goody two-shoes. Well, I'm not asking you to be. I'm saying as we abide in the word and the word abide in us, we have access to blessings and increase. That's what I'm saying. If you're here today and you have not yet received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or you need to ratify that covenant because you had received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but you've been living under a curse and you know it now. Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I come to you today just as I am. You know my life and you know how I've lived. Forgive me, Lord. I repent of my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died for my sins. And on the third day, he was raised from the dead. Lord Jesus, I ask you, Come into my heart. Live your life in me and through me from now on. From this day forward, I belong to you. In Jesus' holy name, amen, amen, amen. Well, if you said that prayer for the very first time, I want to encourage you and salute you right now that you have just pulled your fat out of the, out of the, curse fire in the area of the curse of God. Now, maintain. Walk free from the curse. I'm encouraging you to go to our website, faithlifecc.org. Go to the salvation button. You can download and print that same prayer that we just prayed there. You might want to say that a few times and get that separation from the world down in your spirit and begin again. Get on the pathway of wholeness blessings and increase your life will never be the same pastor daryl barnett 
Faith Life Christian Center, where Jesus is Lord. Let the Lord go before you to show you the way, above you to watch over you, behind you to encourage you, and within you to give you peace. In Jesus' holy name. Amen, amen, amen. God's blessings.